The European Foundation Centre has launched a new benchmarking tool called Compass, uh, and you can find out more about that. It's to help you, the members of EFC. You can find out more about Compass at the EFC desk in the Magritte foyer. That's enough from me for now. We're going to have uh, an interactive panel discussion later, but to set the contest and to formally open proceedings, I am delighted and honoured to welcome onto the stage Luc Leuten, who is chair of the Conference Committee and of the Belgian Federation of Philanthropy. Foundations. Luke, thank you so much for having us all here, and over to you, sir. Thank you. Dear members of uh, EFC, ladies and gentlemen, as chair of the 2018 Conference Committee, it's my honour and pleasure to welcome you in Brussels for the 29th EFC conference, Culture Matters, Connecting Citizens and Uniting Communities. In the coming days, you will help us discuss why culture really does matter, why it is a vital sign of life in every society and community here in Brussels, in Belgium, in Europe, everywhere. Culture is a celebration of and a monument to the diversity of the communities we live in. It is an inheritance from the past, enjoyed in the present and entrusted to us for the future. Connecting people by culture Listening, reading the different media, the social media, the news, but also listening to the people around us, we talk a lot about our differences, the distinction between us. We talk less about the things, the values that connect us, that join us together. Our mind is so close and so present, culture. Culture is key for our well-being. Culture is food for our spirit, our soul, our mind. Culture is the binder to help people to live together. It is an important building block for our social tissue and our cohesion. Culture stimulates a broad and open view on the world. Culture stimulates civic spirit, good citizenship and experience of our identity. Culture stimulates a critical self-consciousness. Culture motivates us for a social reflection and intellectual challenge. Connecting by culture to help people to connect and putting and putting people together. That's why we are here in the Congress all together. To help frame the conversation this week, there will be three plenaries. The opening plenary today will hear from inspiring leaders that have made culture and cultures a focal point in their work and to will invite delegates to reflect on the important role they can play in ensuring that it remains a shared priority. These first speakers will help us to understand why we need strong policies to support culture to connect citizens. On Wednesday, the middle plenary will look at what culture can do at local level to unite communities. There are plenty of novelties, of novelties at this year's conference, and I'm particularly excited by the walk and talk sessions on Wednesday morning, tomorrow. When the theme of the conference is connecting people by culture, you cannot stay in the same room for two days and a half. 
The idea of the walk and talk is to going out of this room to see, to visit a broad spectrum of culture, the real life of culture in Brussels. And by doing this in groups of 20, 25 people, it makes it easier to connect, to network, to talk with each other. Between the sessions, there will be small performances. This morning, an audience engagement activity. Tomorrow, the Fanfa Kids. And Thursday, a stand-up comedian. And this evening, there will be the opportunity to visit an exhibition of major European artworks from Tipoli to Richter, European Dialogue. The exhibition takes place in the saint Contenaire Museum and is organized and sponsored by the King Baudouin Foundation and 13 other European foundations. The dinner to which the King Baudouin Foundation cordially invites takes place this evening in the same museum. I would also like to point you in the direction of the fantastic EFC exhibition at Philanthropy House, five minutes walk from here, on preserving heritage and transforming spaces. 16 projects from EFC members highlight the diverse nature of culture in Europe today, showing visitors the exciting and innovative ways in which they engage citizens and enhance everyday lives. Culture matters. I hope that by the end of this week, we will all understand why. Thank you, and I wish you all a very fruitful an inspiring Congress. Thank you very much indeed, Luke. It connects us. It is the key to our well-being. It is good for our spirit and our soul. With those uplifting words, uh, we start our discussion on precisely the role that culture plays in bringing people together, in binding communities in the way that Luke described. You've heard about the packed and exciting program. Uh, it is clear how much very hard work has gone into preparing this event. So thank you to Luke, you, Luke, and to the whole of the committee uh, and the organizing team for putting such a good program together for us. Uh, Luke already mentioned it. Uh, you're going to have something a little bit different now, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I am delighted to welcome to the stage Sergio Gratteri, who is a musicologist and cultural entrepreneur. He's an expert in audience engagement. I have no idea what he's going to do, but believe you me, uh, I think you're going to get quite engaged. So, Sergio, over to you. <laughs> Good morning, good morning. Listening, a lot of listening, a lot of talking, a lot of, a lot of workshops, you're gonna do so many things and of course you have to warm up for that. So this is what they asked me to do. I'm gonna warm you up and what is the most powerful tool that you have to warm yourself up, which you always have with you? It is your body, but even more, your voice. So yes, I am gonna sing with you. This is the reaction I expected, like, oh my God, no, sing, I cannot sing. Even the moderator was saying this earlier on. I cannot sing. If, if I start singing, then people will run out, uh, the uh, out of the room. We'll see about that. Why do I hear this so often? If every time I hear this, this reaction, and I would ask one euro for it, I would be a millionaire. And why do I hear this so often? It's because I am, as she said, I am Sergio Roberto Grateri. I'm a musicologist, but I'm also the founder of one of the biggest singing projects in this city, which is Singing Brussels. And this is a project that makes thousands of people sing from all different layers of society throughout the whole year. People like you. So don't worry, I will guide you through this process and you will be amazed in the end how much actually you're able to do. So if you're ready, let's start, and we can only start and really warm up if you all stand up. Okay. Can everyone see me? Good. And we're gonna start rubbing our hands. Okay, and we're gonna bring our hands up, and middle, and down, and middle, and up, 
a middle and down, a middle and up, a middle and down, and we were up. <laughs> I already see some people, oh my God, like, okay. It's normal, your brain is, is waking up, okay. Now say, I'm gonna do a motorcycle. Just look at me first. It's like you're on the motorcycle when you were like a kid, like Okay, now you Don't forget to breathe. Robbie. Say hello to the person next to you on your left. <laughs> Say hello to the person to your right. <laughs> and stop. This is important, I'm gonna give you four instructions. This means stop, or oh, this, stop. This means go on. This means not higher, because then it will be weird, but louder. This means softer. Yeah, okay. Repeat after me. Doom. T. T. Kish. T. T. Doom T. Kish 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 T. Look at me. Okay. Now I'm gonna do doom, t, kish, t. 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 Doom, t. Great. I see other people's brain waking up now. Dum ti kish ti, dum ti. That's fine, as long as you're moving. That's the most important thing. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna take out the vowels of the, what I just said. So it's not dum ti kish ti, but it's dum ti kish ti. Dum ti kish ti. Dum ti kish ti. Dum ti kish ti. I'm gonna speed up a bit. Great. Just, I hope that in the next days you will not be answering or, or speaking like a moderator or asking questions with the same volume you have now. Which is a bit like... Okay, keep that in mind. This is the first rhythm. Try to remember that a bit. The next one, I'm gonna wake up the other side of your brain. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Now I'm gonna listen to the stress. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay. <laughs> and I'm gonna clap with that. Just me, look at me. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Good. Now, without the one, two, three, four, huh? <laughs> just, just in, you can still count because it's necessary, but just internally. So you have. Okay. I see there's still people, some like one, two, three, four, five, six, no. It's fine, but this, you can hear, and that's a beautiful thing of doing things together, is that even the people who are completely, as we say in French, à côté de la plaque, like completely on another world, you still beautifully blend in. Huh? Uh, okay, so we have, this is the second rhythm. The third is a melody, very simple. A bit of the sound of music, way of pronunciation it, uh, pronunciating it. Do, re, ti, do, do, re, ti, do, do, re, 
ti do do re ti do do re ti do do re ti do that's already three four do ti so so do ti so so do ti so so do ti so so stop now we're going to put it all together and you're going to see that it's beautiful of course we're not going to you cannot choose so i'm going to make some groups people from bozar also there so let's say uh, i need four groups so you until there that's one group or maybe let's say just the whole uh, left section but for you the right section then we have this more or less is number two and then we have this more or less number three and this is number four ready Louder. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Do re ti do do re ti do. You are wonderful. You are wonderful. You are lost. <laughs> okay, which is fine. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three. I'm going to make it a, maybe a bit simpler for you. <laughs> I thought this was a simple warm up, but you're doing great. Let's go straight into the real singing then. One, two, three, four, five, six. 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 One. Three, four, five, six, one. Without the counting? Good. Remember this for later. <coughs> this group. So it's a bit bigger. We're going to make three groups. Doom, 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 doom. Dum 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 Nice Da da dum, da da dum, da dum, 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 da da dum.
Ya 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 da da, 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 ya 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 ya, ya 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 ya, ya ya ya, da da da, da 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 da, da da da. Now for the Medi keep on going for the Mediterraneans, the Greek people, the Italian people. <laughs> And I can improvise on this. I can improvise. Have a beautiful day today. Try to learn something new today. Don't you ever dare again to tell anyone that you cannot. To tell anyone that you cannot sing. Enjoy your day. Thank you very much indeed, Sergio. I think we're all warmed up now, and I particularly love two things. That tip, don't forget to breathe, always essential. And it's, he's obviously a diplomat and a motivational speaker. I'm going to make it simpler for you, ladies and gentlemen, but you're doing great. Thank you very much, Sergio. That was terrific, and I hope you're now all warmed up and in the mood. Uh, we are going to discuss why culture matters, and as Luke said earlier, uh, some of the key challenges involved in supporting culture in the most effective way possible through public policies and programs, the role of philanthropy in all of this. But to inspire us and set the context for our panel discussion, I'll introduce our other speakers uh, after this. But first, I am delighted to welcome to the stage Jan Gussens, who is General Director of the Festival de Marseille, and he's a champion of the arts here in Belgium as well, many of you will know that he led the Flemish Royal Theatre, KVS, for 15 years and made it a key cultural organisation in this country and internationally. He was awarded the title of Chevalier de l'Ordre des Arts et des Lettres by the French Ministry of Culture in spring 2016. We're delighted to have him with us. Jan, over to you. Thank you, Jackie, and thank you, Luke, for uh, inviting me. I apologize in advance for being less entertaining than Sergio, <laughs> but I'll do my best. May you live in interesting times. These are the words with which Chinese artist Ai Weiwei said goodbye to me when I visited his studio in Beijing a few years ago. And with an ironic smile, he added that in China, that was not by definition a way of wishing people the best. It could also be a polite but subtle way of anticipating and even announcing bad news. The underlying message being, of course, that times had better not be interesting, not filled with evolutions, changes, transformations, let alone revolutions. In short, if there is no news, that means good news. I think we can safely say that these are interesting times in Europe, very interesting times even, but the news is not necessarily good news. It mostly isn't actually. 
and before we embark on a discussion of arts and culture and how they can be reinforced and financed in smarter and more effective ways, I think it is helpful to stop, step back, and look at what is going on around us so that we can better ask the question, what forms of art and culture do we really need to support? And in which larger project should they play a key role? It doesn't seem to be an ex exaggeration to say that the recent Italian election has at last catapulted us into what is probably the deepest crisis of the European project since the Second World War. Europe has become a battlefield between populists and reformists, between allies and enemies of a solid and shared European future. The ongoing economic difficulties, the deepening social suffering, and last but definitely not least, the immigration crisis, have all contributed to a devastating perception of the European Union as an entity profoundly incapable of offering courageous collective responses to real and urgent problems. Rampant xenophobia is one of the disastrous consequences. Today's overall conclusion is pretty bleak. In the eyes of many Europeans, and their numbers seem to be growing every day, there is hardly any trust left, whether it is in the EU's economic action, its social protection, its international role and influence, or its overall capacity to protect, especially the most fragile groups within our respective populations. Within every single one of the member states, the gap is widening between those who benefit from the single market, from free trade and globalization, and those who feel like they are losing and being left behind every day. Europe seems to be reinventing its own class war between those who have hope, those who say, yes, we can and live that reality every day, and those who feel like there is absolutely no perspective. The antagonisms, divisions, fragmentations, and ensuing crises are profound. As is the case very often, artists have predicted this. One of them is the young Belgian artist Thomas Bellink, who in 2014 predicted, uh, created in this city the Museum of European History in Exile, in the artist's words, a futuristic historic museum. Its basis was a fiction, we are in 2045, and the European Union fully collapsed a few years ago. But in a small country somewhere in the European periphery, a circle of old friends of Europe keep the dream alive. In a series of 15 rooms that every spectator visits individually, Belling shows the emergence, the glory years, and the descent and the collapse of the European project. A leap into the future to look at the present as if it is the past. During its creation in Brussels in 2014 and during consecutive stops in other EU capitals such as Vienna and Athens, many top politicians visited. They were shocked at the sharp, poetic way Belling showed how political and economic paralysis lead to institutional and societal disintegration. But the shock therapy didn't lead to change on the contrary. For the 2018 version of this museum, which Bellink is now working on in Marseille, the artist needs to reinforce the fictional element of the project. Everything that he predicted in 2014 in terms of nightmarish but then unreal visions, such as the Brexit, has now become reality. Reality beat the fiction. In the face of this kind of a crisis, it seems to me that two positions are possible. Either we hide somewhat comfortably, for a little while longer at least, behind Europe's achievements. They are impressive, I agree. We fight in popularity with immobility, and we turn Europe even more into a project that is dealt with on a mainly administrative level. I am convinced that that approach will ultimately lead to collapse, maybe even to conflict and war. Or we try things radically differently. We restart, relaunch, even try to redirect the European project. The notions of the commons, of sharing and solidarity, of deeply investing in exchanges and building bridges, undoubtedly will have to be at the heart of such a reinvention. On many levels and in many fields. If we want to fight our way out of this crisis, crisis, it seems hard to imagine that we would not need common defense banking budget policies. But we can't stop there 
or more correctly, we cannot start there. It is my strong conviction that we need to start from ambitious cultural projects and policies that create shared European spaces that we desperately need but cruelly lack. European cultural programs and the support of foundations will have to play a key role in the realization of that urgent need. In a European space and projects that are increasingly at risk of self-sufficient nationalist retreats, of polarizing identity politics, where fences and walls are showing up in more and more places and regions, even beyond the continent as such, the creation of shared space spaces which can be real pockets of resistance, is of the utmost importance. These spaces will not offer the solution to all of Europe's economic and social challenges, of course not. But it is my conviction that we will not develop those solutions either, if first of all we do not invest in encounters, conversations, exchanges and collaborations between individual citizens or diverse communities that do not share a common past, but that will somehow have to build a common future. And that is the challenge that Europe is facing. Politicians face up less and less to this challenge. Their language and discourse, their acts are becoming ever more divisive. And in the world of business and economic policies, it is becoming ever harder to look beyond short-term and individual interests. We urgently need protected, soft-spoken spaces of mutual trust, where fragility, adventure and creation are seen as qualities, not as weaknesses, and where long-term, in-depth exchanges can be allowed to happen. Increasingly in today's Europe, these spaces are spaces of art and culture, or they are not. It is here that a new, innovative, sustainable notion of common ground, common interests, common strategies and future are being and will have to be invented. And seeing how national cultural policies put these spaces of cultural and civic innovation more and more at risk, even see them as dangers, or at best as totally uninteresting for self-centered and commercialized political agendas that focus on the reproduction of existing identities and models, on notions of attractivity and prestige that lead to short-term economic benefits, I think it is pretty clear where European cultural programs and cultural investments by major foundations can make a real difference. We can discuss all kinds of administrative technicalities, and I will discuss a few of them in a minute. But in the end, the question is really, which projects do we want to support and defend that will not exist if we don't? How can we put artistic creation, social invention, solidarity and generosity really at the heart of what we invest in? And which contents and participants should these projects mobilize? Whom should they bring together and be in dialogue with? And which new and common perspectives should they offer? In the end, these perspectives should go beyond purely artistic and cultural objectives. Yes, I think they should actually change the world, however vague and naive that may sound. But the stakes are so high today, the dangers for the generations that come after us are very diverse and very real. We need to at least have the ambition of developing a more hopeful vision and future for our children. And such a vision will have to emerge out of more inclusive, shared and artist-driven conversations. Let me try and be a bit more concrete. At the Marseille Festival that I direct, and that is built around new work, mainly in the performing arts, a crucial challenge is how to develop projects that bring together and offer a space of encounter and exchange to citizens of a city that is deeply, deeply divided. Marseille from afar looks like a multicultural paradise, but it actually isn't, at least not yet. Economic, social and cultural divisions run deep and the considerable part of the ruling political class is totally fine with the idea that that reality, which leads directly to social fragmentation, inequality and violence, does not change and remains unquestioned. Artists and cultural projects should at least try to show that Marseille's reality could actually be different. In last year's edition of the festival, we created a project together with the Berlin-based company Rimini Protocol called 100% Marseille, 
a hundred citizens of the city that reflected its reality according to a number of simple social and cultural criteria, shared the stage for an hour and a half, responding to a series of questions that made very clear who they are, where they come from, and what their political, social, and cultural sensibilities are like. We filled the National Theatre of Marseille three times with the project. Every night, 70% of the 700-person audience was at that National Theatre for the first time. Almost right across the board, the popular audience reactions were extremely positive. Finally, we get to see and listen to our own city, people said. Politically, however, there was pretty straightforward opposition. And the politicians were quite open and clear about the fact that their reasons for not appreciating the project were exactly the same ones that brought the popular audiences to like it. 100% Marseille confronted them with a shared space, obliging them to listen to Marseille's citizens they'd rather ignore. The 100% project has been done in many cities around the world, from Brussels over Montreal to Sao Paulo. According to the creators of Rimini Protocol, it is only in not fully democratic contexts, mostly outside of Europe, that the project encountered political tension and opposition. So far, mostly outside of Europe, but it also did in Marseille. And my intuition is that such inclusive projects that create free spaces of dialogue could lead to more and more serious opposition in more and more European cities and political contexts. At the same time, it is a project that is needed more than ever. And that is why and where other potential fun funders need to step in. If public funders have agendas that more and more exclude inclusive projects, if private sponsors shy away because they depend on a mutual consensus with the political elite, then European programs and foundations can offer crucial alternatives. Let me be a bit more technical now. In my experiences with European programs and independent foundations, I increasing, increasingly come across the same obstacles, some of which seem to be more and more or become more and more problematic. There often seems to be a wide and ever widening gap between the theoretical framework of funding programs and the actual concrete selection processes on the one hand and choices on the other hand. Especially in Creative Euro programs, I am sometimes really surprised to see what the consensual and safe choices are that emerge from theoretical frameworks that can be quite daring and innovative. In general, there seems to me to be a tendency away from real creation, real invention and adventure. Everything needs to be planned, defined, fixed well in advance. I think real artists and creators do not work and function that way, and I'm really glad they don't. Arts do not equal education, where we should and can define the objectives and goals as well as possible beforehand. And creation also does not equal cultural heritage. In artistic creation processes, we should define artists, participants, contents, and methodology, but we should never want to know in advance what the outcome will be. Heritage projects are important and legitimate, but they should not become the basis of our European culture of the future. We want to invent a new and common culture. Especially in European selection processes, there needs to be more clarity about who makes the selections. Right now, there is no transparency about that at all, and I think it would enhance the quality of the procedure and choices if that could be discussed more openly, or at least evaluated now and then. The idea is not to open the door for lobbying and influencing, but to make sure that selection criteria, procedures, and the individuals that make selections can be in mutual conversation in interesting ways. I think it would be worthwhile to establish a more direct, a more permanent and in-depth conversation between European cultural policy makers, foundation policy makers, cultural operators and artists. Right now, I have the feeling that there is a wide divide and that the needs and urgencies of operators and artists are not enough reflected, not deep enough reflected in what the policy makers are proposing. Programs with their criteria and goals change too much, 
both on a European level and on the level of foundations. We need to be able to build long-term and sustainable projects and trajectories and invest in common goals that we can agree on for the next 10 years. No fundamental changes can ever be accomplished in two or four years' time. And last but not least, let's not be too Eurocentric. I travel outside of Europe constantly and have worked in recent years in Central Africa, Tunisia and the Middle East. I am convinced that we cannot reinvent Europe if we do not include these parts of the world and their artists and citizens in the conversations because they are facing much more serious crises and obstacles than we do and they have really serious needs but also because very often they have developed much more imaginative and effective responses and solutions. So they need our support, but we also need their inspiration. Artistically speaking, we might have developed some exciting new forms, but they really have fascinating content to offer. And so EU or foundation funding programs need to make possible much more easily that we exchange and work together with non-EU partners that need to be treated in the same manner and on the same level as us. Europe is very present today in the imaginaries and young, of youngsters in Africa and the Arab world, and Africa and the Arab world are very present in our major European cities. We need to be able to translate this into intercultural and intercontinental collaborations that are too hard to set up now. To say a few more words about this north-south divide, in the past years I spent a considerable part of my time traveling and working in cities and regions such as Tunis, Bamako in Mali and Kinshasa in DRC, Ramallah and Nablus in Palestine, or Port-au-Prince in Haiti. These are all cities and regions that experience direct and devastating effects from dictatorships, armed conflict, occupation and natural disasters. I think we would benefit enormously from exchange projects with such places, places of tension and destruction. Because solidarity makes us into more noble human beings, but also because in today's European capital cities, Tunis, Bamako, Kinshasa, Ramallah and Port-au-Prince are no longer exotic and faraway places. They are intimately connected to the multicultural, urban European contexts in which so many of our young European citizens of tomorrow grow up. To end with, I would want to say two things that might seem to contradict each other, but that I take equally seriously. We are going through a major European crisis and we won't find any solutions and exits if we don't invest solidly and sustainably in artists and creations that help us develop shared European conversations and spaces for the future. Our European culture, identity, citizenship, they do not exist in some inflexible and definitive way. They need to be invented every day and we don't do so without artists and their capacity to imagine and envision what is new, unexpected, but really necessary. At the same time, this, cri this crisis is deep enough to say art and culture will not be enough. They need to be part of a larger conversation and vision that are clear and ambitious about the European society that we want to live in in 10 years from now, about its values, its solidarity and openness, and about the cross-sectoral exchanges that will need to make it happen. And finally, about how that European society connects to the rest of the world. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jan. Please, do come and join me. Come and join me, Jan, in the seats over here for our panel discussion. Thank you so much for that very inspiring speech, that very challenging speech <laughs> about the depths of the crisis we face and how you see the role of culture. And you've already addressed some of the key issues I would like to discuss about how best to support those sorts of ambitious projects you're talking about. Where are the gaps? You indicated inclusiveness, for example, where philanthropy can make a difference, where the public may not step in. Some of those issues around the selection of projects. What do we support? Where can we help it most? Lots to discuss. Let me invite to join Jan and I on the stage to discuss these key challenges that need to be addressed to provide that effective support that Jan is pleading for and the role of philanthropy in this are two other champions of European culture. I'm delighted to welcome Nina Obulien, who is Croatian Minister for Culture. Please do come and join me, Minister. She has worked 
on various cultural projects for international organizations. She's a former winner of the European Cultural Policy Research Award for her work on the impact of EU enlargement on cultural policies. And like Jan, ladies and gentlemen, we have two uh, holders of the Order of Arts and Letters awarded by the French Ministry with us today. You have something in common. A uh, very warm welcome, Minister, and thank you so much for being with us. And last but not least, Martine Reichertz, who is a member of the Board of Governors, uh, Board of Directors of the Central Bank of Luxembourg, but here today, more in her capacity as a former Director General for Education and Culture in the European Commission. She recently retired from that post, so she's now free to tell us what she really thinks. Uh, <laughs> so, a very warm welcome to both of you. Uh, and Minister, if I could start with you, we, I've asked uh, our other speakers not to make opening statements. We just want to dive in because Jan has raised so many very interesting points that I would like to uh, touch on with you. But Minister, to start with, the importance of culture. I mean, Jan said, it's where we need to start if we are to, and I quote, restart, relaunch and redirect the European project. Would you agree with the importance that he is putting on culture as part of that and the challenges that we face uh, in order to provide the most effective support? Uh, well, I fully agree with the opening speeches, though I don't fully agree with everything that you said. <laughs> Uh, but we will have no time to go into the debate. <laughs> but uh, I was very attentively listening to the, uh, to the opening remarks and especially about this, if I understood correctly, uh, your look and your perception of this crisis in Europe, which is, I think, uh, something that gathers all of us uh, in different forums and around different uh, topics. But in the center of the debate, we all share this concern that in particular the values around which we gathered, uh, somehow they don't seem to be shared or we don't manage to, uh, to transcend uh, and to share this message uh, as broadly as it is necessary in order for the European uh, projects uh, to uh, continue developing. And I, I fully agree uh, with you and with all of those who, uh, who when reflecting on this deep uh, crisis, uh, put culture and education in the center of this question. Of course, not saying at, at all, that uh, the economic stability and that, uh, 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 also other, other aspects are not important, on the contrary. But I think uh, a part of this situation where we are now is probably also because we were for a long time putting these topics on a, uh, on a side. So I, I truly believe that through, uh, in particular through education and, and, and through culture, we can address these inequalities, these fears, uh, these uh, um, concerns, and, 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 and try to deal if it is, and I believe that it is possible. And just a quick follow-up before I come to you, Martin. How well do you think we are doing now in terms of supporting uh, European culture? We heard some concerns expressed at more detail. We'll come back to the more detailed level uh, of selection of projects, those sorts of things. The plea for more ambition, I think, uh, was what I heard most from Jan. But how well are we doing? What's the challenge in front of us to make sure that we support culture most effectively? Well, first of all, I think that we are doing much better than we were, let's say, 10 or 15 or 20 years ago when it comes to the position of culture and understanding the importance of culture in the, uh, to the, in the, in the European project. Uh, I think uh, 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 together, uh, uh, I would put, even though I'm here now as a minister policy maker, a little bit at the end of this line, but primarily through big engagement of the European culture sector, backed up also by the foundations and not because they are the ones who hosted the, <laughs> the conference, but in general, I think that we, we did a lot in the past 10 or 15 years to bring these concerns and, and these agendas more in the center of the big, debate or at least closer to the center of the debate and if I can uh, be a little bit bureaucrat uh, because I'm 
a minister at the moment, I can't help it. <laughs> but with the, uh, I think if we look at the new agenda on culture that was published last week uh, by the Commission, I, as, as a minister, but also as an expert, I'm really proud because I think we have in our hands a very good strategic document which is somehow out outlining the key challenges, but is also, which is not so often, uh, which was not the case with the previous documents, is already sending a message like what can be done at the European yeah. level and what is there for the member states to be more engaged. And, I re and it's, it's very realistic on the achievements. It's not trying to uh, uh, invent uh, uh, completely new topics, which was but also a disease yeah. that we had before, like every president was coming with their priorities, yeah. and then every six months we were changing priorities. So here we have, I think, a very good tool in our hands to reflect on both from uh, us who are there to give stability, support, financing, and those who are there to challenge that we are doing okay. everything wrong. But okay. So we are, it sets us on the right track. The question then I will be the implementation. Uh, Martin Reichert, if I could ask you, in terms of, of the role that culture plays at this particularly, we live in deeply interesting times, um, as was said. How do you see the role of culture? How much importance would you attach? And for you, what are the challenges ahead? Okay, uh, first of all, hello to all of you. I think all those who know me have know how blunt I can be, so I will be <laughs> as blunt as usual, so no more than, than before I was as Director General. I will start with a personal story, which is that when I joined, uh, when I came back to Brussels, I was offered four positions as a director general. And I will not say by whom, because it's going to be a little bit difficult. <laughs> and I said I would like to join DJ EAC. And that person, who was, of course, at a very high level in the commission, said to me, what the hell are you doing in this DG? And I will not give the name of the DG he used because it's not very polite. And I said to him, I really believe in it because that's the key point. Just to explain to our non-Brussels audience, DG AAC, DG AAC Education, thank you, thank you. Director thank you. General for Education and Culture. Education and Culture, which has always been considered inside the house, especially by our male friends inside the house, of course, as a minor Director General. Mm -hmm. And I think this is the way it is. And I think this is the kind of things we may say here. And I must say, Jackie, I'm very proud that this is not the case anymore. I left for personal reasons, but I must say I'm very, I'm very proud to say that DG Eac is back on stage. And they now have understood finally that education, that they really have understood, and culture, are really key in the whole problem, and that's the answer to the crisis. This being said, to be blunt again, and to come back with very basic figures, and I will not kill you with figures because that's not the point of today. When you look at the budgets, the global budget of the European Union is more or less, huh? I use rough figures because that's no, no point, 160 billion, a billion a billions, okay? 160 billions. The budget of Creative Europe, which is also media, by the way, so the whole package per year is 250 million. I think when you've said this, you've said it all. That's all I wanted to say as a starting point. <laughs> <laughs> so as you say, that start, and that brings us back to the question, in difficult times, in financially constrained times, where do we focus the resource we've got? You'd like more, but where do we focus what we've got? How do we deliver maximum impact and maximum EU added value? And, and Jan, um, a question to you on, on that. You talked uh, about... Um, inclusiveness, you mentioned that. Uh, you said don't focus so much, I think I was, you were implying too much of a focus on heritage projects uh, to date. Maybe that's been the fashion, I don't know whether I'm... Um, but your plea was for support to create European spaces. So what do we do? Where would you, given budgets are constrained, whether at EU level or national level or regional level, where do we need to focus in terms of, of that public support uh, in order to deliver maximum bang for bucks? And particularly at the EU level, we're in Brussels. Where can they add most value? I think we need to create European commons. That, that really needs to be uh, um, our, our priority. And uh, in order for that to, uh, 
be able to emerge, um, we need spaces where European artists, cultural practitioner, practitioners and citizens can converge, can exchange, can, uh, can meet to begin Physical with. spaces, virtual spaces, both? Oh, I, th I, th I think, I think they, c they can be physical spaces. They, I mean, that's always, uh, that's always uh, I think, an, an added value to have physical spaces. So whether they are festivals, um, uh, a European theatre institution that is really focused on that, or uh, a project like 100% Marseille, but then on a European level, uh, I think all of the above can be uh, interesting. Uh, what I see now is that uh, no one uh, is actually taking the lead uh, when it comes to such projects and uh, financing them and making them possible. Mm -hmm. um, and what I see uh, is that it is obviously true that culture has moved more to the center. It is true that um, there is money uh, it is true that uh, in the theoretical frameworks, as I mentioned, uh, some ambition is being formulated, um, but the, the, the impact and the implementation and the impact, I think, um, are, are lacking in, in ambition, in uh, uh, creativity, and, and in... And in um, uh, and, and, you, and being the, daring enough. And the point you um, made in your speech about you can start with fairly ambitious, daring-looking frameworks for deciding what support, uh, but you feel something happens and we get too consensual, we get too safe. We'll come back to the role where the philanthropy can help to fill that gap. Um, why do you think that happens? Is it because... Th that I don't really know, but what I see happen in the, the, the practice of uh, Creative Europe programmes being put in place, and I'm not going to give uh, examples, but I do, do have them, um, is that projects that try in, in, in all kinds of ways uh, imagine what I'm defending. Uh, for example, uh, uh, there was uh, an, an, a project formulated by 15 um, European um, uh, cultural organizations that wanted uh, money and funding to allow artists uh, to engage in long-term residencies um, in um, fragile uh, areas, um, uh, neighborhoods of key uh, European cities. Yeah. Uh, this is not something that these organizations, some were really small, um, can finance on their own budgets, and this is not what we see that national governments are um, uh, defending and financing today. Um, well, that project uh, is not being given European yeah. money either. Um, and on the other hand, I have the impression that safer, uh, clearer, uh, more consensual projects that are often also being carried by more central, more prestigious Tend to um, win the support. institutions yeah. Yeah. like opera houses or big museums. Yeah. Yeah. Um, compared to three to four years ago, such projects um, are given more space, more money and support than the projects that I think are important. I'm not going to ask you to defend the Commission now, no, that's not no. your job, but do you think we are uh, too consensual, too safe, that one of the things public money needs to do is enable risks to be taken, enable, be a bit more daring? I think that's very easy to say. I think, first of all, for the time being, we work in a specific frame which exists. And I think, again, you know, my, co my former colleagues are now working on the next program, and we now have this communication, so this needs to be adopted. So I think now it's really time to come with new ideas. And I think I, I share uh, Jan's concerns about selection processes, etc., about the people who know how it works, and they usually get the best out of it. I think that's exactly what it is. This being said, this can be changed, but for the time being, we are in a frame. What I wanted to say is, and share another experience with you from my, when I was a director general in this place, is culture is also very sensitive, because culture can also be very political. Mm. And I remember having a very tough time with a project which was very innovative, very interesting, by the way, with a German uh, theater, 
where, and I will not give in, go into the details, otherwise the wars will start again, <laughs> where the problem with our Turk friends was really very upside, it was really upside down. And frankly, I was on the wall for months because what you, when you look at what we say objective criteria, it's not always objective. And Waterloo, for example, to give a neutral example, is a victory for some people and it's a, and it's a lost battle for others. And that's the problem. And again, again, you know, it's so sensitive. And again, when you ask politicians to talk about culture, it's about emotions. And that's what is so much fun about culture. And that's why we need more creativity in the program, but it's easy saying, but it's really difficult to but put in place. But does that mean, are we identifying there, and you indicated earlier when you talked about the political sensitivities of inclusiveness, those projects, and you said maybe this is somewhere where the foundations need to step in because of the public. Is that an area, Martin, where you think it is, you see a clear role for philanthropy to support culture because, because you can't or you couldn't in your old role? Absolutely, and I said very clearly in one of the conferences we had organized, and most of the people inside this room were also there, and I shocked the people, as usual, by the way, <laughs> so just to see if they're still awake, I think stop asking the European Union to do your job. I think some of the, peop of the things we will never be able to do, and I think at some stage when we talk about collaborative whatever, we also need a collaborative culture because you were talking about young people working together, etc., and where I fully, I completely disagree with you, is not to us to organize a society for our youngsters. We messed up, I'm very sorry to say, and my generation especially. So I think let's ask the young people now what they want to do, and not again from Brussels or from wherever, teach them lessons because that's the things they hate and then afterwards they vote not because they are populist, they vote against the system because they are fed up of okay. those oldies like me teaching them what they should think. Minister, so clearly there what we should do, what we shouldn't do. Uh, in terms of public money, philanthropic money, uh, how do you see uh, the relative roles of the two sides of that coin and where the EU can fill the gaps? Uh, where it can add most value. And then we'll come to the policy side. Well, culture needs all money it can get, of course. <laughs> but uh, I think this is partly where I, I, I would disagree with your, uh, uh, with your uh, initial comments when you said that we need, I fully agree that we need collaborative spaces, that we need new type of creation that would go beyond what is usual, but we are not doing, we shouldn't do so by neglecting what already exists. So I think there is role for everybody in this and I think there needs to be support for all different segments, including heritage. Uh, so, uh, uh, so in my view, uh, 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 it is quite clear and it's been like that uh, since the beginning of the European project, where is the role of national governments, which should be there really to give this basic support to all segments of arts and culture uh, uh, in, in all its areas. And, in all, and that's what governments do. And the European uh, funding was always there to have this added value, to find those who have uh, sentiment, interest, innovation, to get into transnational projects and to do something else to add to this uh, creation of, of, of the joint uh, uh, European creativity. And there I, I, I need to agree with you that there is a problem sometimes with the procedures, but us who are responsible for public funding, I mean, you need procedures, otherwise you end up somewhere else at so the end of your mandate. So, but there, uh, foundations are probably a bit more, they can be a little bit more innovative, they can be a bit more brave, no. uh, they can uh, experiment. They're, they're, and, and this is why I think it is very good that this conference, uh, which is gathering the most important uh, European foundations is putting the discussion on co of culture in, in the center. For foundations, it's also easier to 
build programs that would be open to interdisciplinary projects, which we definitely need today. We are all the time talking about connecting culture and innovation, of course, culture and education, it goes without saying, but this is sometimes where, where national funding schemes and, 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 and European funding schemes, they need a lot of bureaucracy in order to come up with an innovative new fund. Uh, while for other funders, it might be, they might be a little bit responsive to the needs and to good ideas. And on, on the policy side, and you mentioned at the beginning the new European agenda uh, for culture, and the emphasis that puts on, it put, talks a lot about mobility, it talks about the better support for the sector, we've talked about that, and, and the money. It talks about strengthening links with industrial policy, so making this, uh, making the case in terms of growth uh, and jobs and so on. And also your point from your speech about cooperation with third countries, the international element. Are they the right elements, do you think, uh, in terms of a policy framework that supports effectively? Is there anything missing? And, and how do you think foundations can influence that policy debate as well as providing some of the meetings some of the funding gaps. Minister well, first then. Uh, as I said, I mean, there has, there has been no uh, much time for reflection on this new yeah. agenda. It's been out for only a week, but I, I really think it sets a very good framework. Uh, it has a very uh, strong position on the role of culture for social cohesion. And then looking at different aspects, starting from the status of the creator and the position of the creator, but also a participation in cultural life, it has a very clear uh, overview of the economic contribution and economic dimension of culture and creative industries, but again, luckily, putting it in the broader context, in the, uh, in the context of these values that I was mentioning mm -hmm. at the beginning, which personally I like very much. I think that the, that the rhetoric, with all, which only looks at, at culture as the one that has a, a possibility to create new employment, and then it, it goes a little bit away yeah. from some of the, of the, of the key ideas. There's a risk ideas in over yeah. that. This yeah. is always this dilemma, uh, uh, do you look at it from its intrinsic or instrumental uh, role? And then there is this, which is particularly important, and, and I'm really grateful that you mentioned that in your opening speech, uh, this whole element of uh, culture in external relation cooperation, the, 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 the need to be in dialogue with the others, not to be closed up in our, in our borders and uh, 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 intercultural dialogue uh, 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 and, and all of this. So I, I think this is also something which might not come as a first instinct to the governments. There is a lot of work that has been done recently through also international uh, uh, development policies trying to include culture there. But this is something where foundation can certainly do a lot work on the different mobility schemes, uh, uh, but from this viewpoint of looking at what it brings in terms of implementing uh, the, the importance of our development agenda. Thank you very much. Martine. Yeah, I think, first of all, I will come back to, with a positive message. And first, I think, come back to the European Year of Cultural Heritage. The simple fact that we're all sitting here together in the context of this year is already a major step forward. Because nobody three years ago would have thought that for seconds that this would happen. Some of, major, of the major actors who helped me are in this room and I really wanted to thank you. And also to thank the foundation. Because, and I will make the link with Erasmus Plus. Last year we celebrated the 30th anniversary of Erasmus. It was a major success. Not because it was steered by Brussels. Because that would never have functioned. It's the students, it's the universities who took it over on the spots. And they invited me and others to join the party and not the other way around. And I think that's where we have to make a major effort. We cannot structure culture from Brussels. It's crazy. It doesn't make sense. I think we need to empower people on the field because they know what's going on. And I think then we need a value added, as we did with the, the text that was issued now a month ago. I think that gives a, a, the general frame. But I think it's up to the actors to take that in their I hands agree. and but, to go for it. But empowerment requires listening. 
And that is what I don't see enough on, on many national levels. Uh, I think we, um, we live in our major European cities, we live on time bombs. Uh, when I worked in Brussels at KVS, I spent my first five years working in Molenbeek. Uh, I am now in Marseille, um, where uh, kids are getting shot in the Quartier Nord uh, every week. Uh, I work together a lot with uh, major theatres in the banlieue of Saint-Saint-Denis in Paris. These are all time bombs. The amounts of young kids living there that do not feel like they have any reason to identify with what is going on in institutional, political and also cultural life. The amount of youngsters that feel like that is huge and they have no perspective and no future to such an extent that, that all kinds of things that we've seen happen in the past five years become fully attractive. So the question is really who is going to take the lead on developing cultural programs that deal with these youngsters and that uh, are all about empowerment, that are all about listening to them. And what I see happen on national levels also in France is the exact opposite. French Minister of Culture just launched a program uh, of which the ambition is what do we do to include uh, in a better way um, regions uh, in the country, uh, areas of our big cities, territoires d'outre-mer, that do not participate enough in official cultural life? What is the solution? Good question, but what is the solution? Let's send um, Paris companies like the um, Comédie Française and let's send artworks of the Louvre to these areas. So, I mean, that is completely missing the point. Yeah, and can, I, can I ask you something else? Because it relates to the role of foundations in this, and maybe they can help. Yeah. To Someone bring needs the to bottom take the up lead. and the top down together, yeah. if you like. But you said uh, you called for a more direct and permanent conversation between the foundation world and the policy making world, and you said there was a wide divide. What do you mean by that? And what do you think we need to do? What would that more permanent conversation look like uh, in practice? It's a wild idea for now. So uh, <laughs> what, what, I'm, what I'm seeing, what I'm really um, hoping for is that uh, someone will take the lead uh, when it comes to what I just mentioned. And I think that this permanent conversation between policymakers on EU level and within foundations on the one hand and cultural pr practitioners and artists on the one on the other hand that that could be a key conversation and it's not happening now I don't think it is happening enough now no I I, I don't see um, in the programs of the EU and uh, most foundations um, a intense enough reflection of what um, uh, some cultural practitioners and artists are building up in terms of know-how um, and in terms of connections and networks um, within some of the, the, the areas that I've just mentioned. Let me come to mentioned. the Minister on this because you've had experience from both sides. You've worked on projects with the European Cultural Foundation uh, and many other projects with different organisations. You're a minister, you're a policymaker. How well do you think the two worlds are working together? Do you share the concerns that Jan has that it's not working as well as it should and must, if I understand you right, Jan, if we're going to address these challenges? Well, first of all, I would like to defend now my colleague, Francois Nissel, but I will not. <laughs> <laughs> but it's always, uh, for a minister, it's always uh, a very inspiring... I, I wrote it in Liberation, <laughs> so I'm not, I'm okay. not just saying so it here and not <laughs> mentioning it It's there. always uh, uh, very, uh, uh, I would say, inspiring when you are challenged with such, with such reflection, because then you ask yourself, uh, is it one or the other? Uh, in my view, uh, the governments, the ministers cannot do. It is one and the other. Uh, it's not now let leave Louvre collection sit only in Louvre because... <laughs> what I said, <laughs> that, but if no, that I'm, is I'm the just, only thing that is happening... Of course, but really uh, I, fully, I fully understand what you are saying. And it's true that, the, uh, uh, that there is space in the mainstream uh, cultural policies to open up more. 
But I would say, uh, as w we very often lose uh, uh, from the focus the role of the cities uh, uh, and the regional authorities, but mm -hmm. in particular cities, because the cities are becoming the world's of, of their own, and the cities are the closest to people, and they are the ones who can do most in, in promoting this kind of programs. Cities are also the cities' budgets for culture in most of the European countries are quite substantive. Uh, Europe is a continent of cities, and uh, then again, we can have a, a, a look at this parallel world. From one side, we are building these European capital of cultures and spending so much money, but then again, we might lose the sight of, of these problems which are developing. I wouldn't call them even problems. The, the, the new, di new, new lives of our cities where they have a huge percentage of people who might be completely excluded. Mm. Uh, so in that sense, I think a sensitive policy would look at all of these levels. And, and the cities should always be also uh, present in these discussions because there are some wonderful examples across Europe sure. where at this level the changes are being made. And in this session, of course, we're focusing on the European level, but m many of the sessions later today, tomorrow and on Thursday, drill down to that local level and what is being done, not just in cities, but rural, the session on nature and so on. Martine, for you, the collaboration with foundations, uh, and then we're going to wrap up. I want to just try and put you all on the spot, but um, you talked about their importance and you talked about the role in some of the work that you've done. Um, but do you think that dialogue needs to be, as Jan suggests, uh, reorganized to make it more permanent, more structured in some way? I'm sorry, Jackie, but I will just come back to, Please, this, uh, yeah, to, to yeah. exclusion and non-exclusion, because I think I need to put this straight. We can always do more, and I fully share what you said. And I used to say when I was talking about Erasmus, if you are called Mohamed, you have less chances than if you are called Charles. And I think that's the better reality as it stands, and we really need to work on this. This being said, inclusion, exclusion, is, the prior is a priority in Creative Europe, in the sports uh, programs, in the education programs, in Erasmus. Mm. Inclusion is a priority. Of course we don't do enough. Of course we have to do more, but I think it is in the political priorities of the institutions. I just wanted to make this... Yeah, yeah. he's going to give you that because you're crackling. Sorry. Uh, I think th it is a priority. It can always be more. And I just wanted to quote in the new financial perspectives, Creative Europe is in a category called cohesion and values. So we have understood that culture and values go together. And the wording is, and I have to read because I don't know it by heart, to build resilient communities, we need to create a sense of belonging. So we know that we need this. The how, of course, is a real problem. And then I come back to your question, because that's where we need foundations, because we need the links between the people on the field. And I've been in Marseille. I know what they're doing in those difficult uh, pieces. You know, I will, and we fund some of them mm -hmm. in the Maison de Quartier and things like this. Mm -hmm. okay. But we need to do much more because as you say, it is a ticking bomb. So we need all the actors. And I think foundation, when I look at their budgets, you know, it's peanuts what we do at the European level when I do look at the budget of some of the foundation in the group we see today. So let's work together. Okay. And I think the foundation could be the link between the politicians and the people on the ground. Okay, very last question, uh, and then we have to close. And it's very, it's not a simple question, but um, I, in terms of identifying some priorities, and I'm going to ask you, Minister, for you as a policymaker, one, and a, and a politician, one priority, one thing from a policy side we need to do, whether it relates to the money or the framework to support culture, what do you think the priority should be, looking at that new agenda, what's the most important thing, and if there's one thing you think foundations need to do? Same questions to all of you, one minute each replies, because that's all we have time for. Minister. <laughs> I'm sure it's nothing. It's not something new, but of what we've discussed, what would you highlight as the most important priorities for both sides? Well, it would be impossible for me to give a straightforward answer to that. What would be that one prior priority? Uh, as I said, I think we have more or less agreed 
on the direction. We have more or less agreed on what are the key challenges. And then each, uh, each layer or each partner in this endeavor uh, should work there where they can see that they can achieve the most. So the key next step, uh, if you so, like, is to identify. So I would say, of course, you can't look at uh, foundations as a monolithic group because each, again, each foundation has their own philosophy, their priorities. There, there is a long way how they got each and every foundation to where they are today with their programs, focuses and everything. But I think now we have a rather coherent uh, and more or less uh, uh, agreed a set of priorities where governments from one side can do something, European Commission, I'm sorry, I'm looking at you now, <laughs> uh, uh, can do something else, uh, and, and, and as, well as, a, uh, as well as the foundation, which are not represented now here, but will be in different panels, and Absolutely. I'm sure that they will be inspired with what will be sure. discussed in and the And they're not here days. because we wanted to get your advice to them as they embark on their three days of discussions of how they can play that role most effectively. Martina, priority for both sides, and then last word to Jan. Yeah, I think foundation have applied one of my basic principles in life, and I will say it in French first. Le bonheur, ça ne se trouve pas, ça se construit. Happiness you don't find, you construct or you build. And that's what foundation are about, because it's precisely to make a better world that foundation were created. Otherwise, you know, we don't need foundations. So I think that's... That's the point number one. Point number two is how can we move from a world of fear where everybody is, where everything is checked and talking about the bureaucracy you were talking about to a world of trust? That's for me the fundamental problem. I think we need to empower people because otherwise if we go on in this world whereby mistrust is the key world, we will, know, we will go nowhere. How to build confidence? And there, I think, you know, foundations can play a major role because they have the experience. So please help us. Thank you very much. Jan, uh, of all the issues you raised in your opening speech and we've discussed in this session, what for you is the most important, let's call it a key next step, if not a priority? Well, I'm, I'm going to speak as a, as a practitioner or as an operator um, working in Marseille today. So what... And, and then whether it's the EU or, f or a foundation or foundations um, uh, financing that. But what I would find extremely meaningful to develop out of uh, Marseille in the next three years is a cultural Erasmus program focusing on the Mediterranean, which would allow young artists, um, potential artists from um, uh, fragile areas in cities such as Marseille, Naples, Athens, Beirut, Tunis, Algiers, Tangiers, um, to um, embark on a, on a two-year training program allowing them to spend uh, three months uh, in residency at a time in each of these cities. And uh, let's see what comes out of that. It will be trust, it will be uh, a new shared space, and it will be uh, a form of belonging, but one that doesn't exist yet today, that one that is not anchored in the past, but one that is uh, uh, projecting itself into uh, a new future. Thank you very much. And Martine indicating there that this is something that is foreseen, is being thought about. So no. you are preaching in a sense, to the converted. But ladies and gentlemen, will you join me in thanking our panel very much indeed for a very inspiring start to our conference. And also a very challenging start to our conference, but I was very struck, Martine said at the end there, it's about making a better world. That's why this matters so much. So the topic you are discussing could not be more important. Just can I give you a couple of housekeeping notes before we break for lunch? This evening's dinner, uh, Luke mentioned it at the beginning, uh, is in the saint Contenaire Museum. There will be buses waiting for you outside in front of the building here at the end of the afternoon session. So that's at six o'clock tonight. They will take you to the museum and it's a shuttle. So if you miss the first ones, don't panic. They'll come back and get more of you and take you there. If you 
want to have a nice early night because you want to be bright-eyed and bushy-tailed for your discussions tomorrow. I don't advise that. I enjoy, advise you to enjoy the evening. But the buses will shuttle back from the museum back to here starting at 9.30 this evening and then it'll be every 20 to 30 minutes until 10.30. Uh, it only remains for, you, for me now to invite you all to lunch which is in the ground, Grand Hall on level minus two and to wish you a very enjoyable and a very stimulating conference. Thank you very much. Thank you to all of you. Bon appétit.